Immerse Me is a digital language education platform that uses virtual reality to help students learn a second language. It's just rolled out its first full US school district in Colorado. And joining me now is Scott Cardwell, who's the CEO and co-founder. Welcome, Scott. Kia ora, Fiona. MBR last interviewed you about Immerse Me back in 2016. So what's changed since then? How much has the company grown? Yeah, well, six years ago, I sort of said what I was going to do, which was go out and make this um, virtual language learning tool. And um, now we've done that. And it's pretty exciting. Yeah, we're sort of rolling out into our first school districts in the US after spending six years in R&D, developing virtual content for up to 12 languages now, um, which was pretty exciting. Got to travel around the world making footage pre-pandemic. But yeah, we've been supporting schools um, ever since. So how many active users have you got on the site? We've got about 10,000 active users at this stage. Um, we've had over 100,000 sort of students involved in piloting the program over the last six or seven years, which is provided... So that's all over the world? Or? Yeah, all over the world. Yeah, it's been amazing. And do you have schools signed up in New Zealand as well? Or? Yep, we've got a couple of schools here in New Zealand and, and a lot in Australia, which is where we put most of our efforts in the early stages. Right. And what's the business model? How do you make money off this? So it's a software as a service. Um, we have an annual subscription fee for students um, and... Generally, that gets built into this, into their course costs for the year um, as part of their language course. I'm curious how you choose what languages. Like, how do, how do you decide? Is it based on user demand? or? Yeah, basically. We've sort of, we focus on academic language learning. So we looked at what are the languages that are taught in sort of mainstream language classes around New Zealand, Australia, um, and the United States and sort of further afield. And, yeah, typically um, it's easy to sort of hone in on a list of languages that are most most popular. And how does the virtual reality work? Can you talk us through how, how you sort of immerse people in, the, in these sort of courses? Yeah, sure. So we, um, we recorded all of our content using a, a 360 camera, which means that we can sort of drop you into uh, Boulangerie in Paris, for example, and you're standing there in front of the shopkeeper. Citron tarts. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. We, and so you can, um, you, and we give you sort of some information about what, they might be saying to you written as a sort of a speech bubble above their head and then we give you what we want you to say in response written at the bottom and um, and you can record yourself using speech AI um, and you can do this on a laptop as well but um, you can also do it on mobile, tablet and a virtual reality headset. Talk about um, your contacts with the US Air Force Academy. How does that work? Yeah, well, we were pretty excited when we heard from them quite a few years ago that they were interested in this kind of technology. They're always at the, the forefront of, of technology and, 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 and innovation. And they reached out to us saying, could you help us to you know, bring our language program to life? Um, and so I said, yes, <laughs> not really knowing what that would mean at the time. Mm. But, um, but yeah, we've, we've managed to form a really good friendship with them and we've done um, some new content for them based on the American curriculum um, and we've worked with quite a few of their their cadets um, in terms of getting feedback about our program and we also ran a, a cyber security study with some of their cyber cadets um, on website vulnerabilities um, and that was really interesting. Um, you've raised 23000 or so in a Kickstarter campaign back in 2016. How have you funded the growth of the business since then? So it's all come from retained earnings from sales from customers. So we we took the product out into schools and um, showed them what we had made and said, would you like to get on board with it? And so we, we were very fortunate to have some amazing early adopters who loved the concept, loved what we were doing, and were happy to kind of sign up their schools to that. Um, and that's allowed us to kind of reinvest into the next stage. And we just built whatever features and content that they needed. Um, and it's kind of slowly started to grow organically from there. Obviously, when you bring in um, external funds, though, it often allows you to grow faster. So have you considered that? Or? We are, and we have considered it, and we are considering it. It's always something that's been there um, in, the, in the background for us. I think we've, we've kind of wanted to go out there and, and show that we could actually make a product that has you know, product market fit that people want to pay for. Um, and I think we've achieved that now, and so we are certainly looking into maybe some, um, some external investment that could help us accelerate. It's often said that being an entrepreneur is a lonely existence. How have you found it? Well, it's an it's interesting piece. I actually, um, I talk to a lot of people about, um, you know, the mental health aspect to it. Um, you know, certainly uh, I heard somewhere on a podcast that someone's saying that anxiety is, is uncertainty times powerlessness. And it's certainly true that as, a, as an entrepreneur in the early stages, you're very uncertain about what's going to happen in the future. And you feel powerless to change that because you've got very limited resources. And so, um, you know, a big thing that I've sort of tried to focus on is 
um, identifying the sources of, of my anxiety um, and, and also surrounding myself with really incredible people who, who believe me and support me and can give me that kind of mental support um, throughout the process. You've got two co-founders, Samuel Leslie and Jeremy Hanf. What role do they play in the business? Um, they're pretty crucial, actually. They, I got them on in the very start because I wanted to have um, people that I trusted um, supporting me and um, supporting the business, obviously, um, and, and providing accountability. Because I think as an entrepreneur, you're so busy being busy that actually sometimes you need to stop and actually look at where you're going. And so we have a, a pretty strong governance focus. We've had monthly directors meetings every single month since we started this, you know, seven years ago. Um, and I also write a, a like a weekly report about what I've been up to, and then just forward it to them so they can kind of keep up to up to date with what's going on. And that's been crucial because it's meant that we've been able to look ahead and identify some of the key risk factors, such as running out of money, um, and and work out how to um, how to prevent that. What's been your biggest hurdle today? Um, I would say actually COVID in some ways. I mean, it actually, I mean, the timing of it was such that um, you'd think being an online education, it would have been a huge opportunity. But the reality was, you know, the education system was under so much pressure. Teachers were under enormous strain to, to try and deliver their programs that they were used to doing in person online. And they just didn't have, you know, the mental capacity to kind of implement something else on top of that, which is totally fair enough. And so, you know, things went a little bit quiet to start with. Um, but I think the customers that we had already been working with were enormously thankful for the product that we've created for them and they were able to use it really effectively. And so coming out of that now, I think there's a lot more appetite and there's a lot more um, understanding of how technology could and should help learners in either real life scenarios or at home. You were part of the Young Enterprise Scheme in high school and, and just uh, have been named as an emerging, emerging alumni finalist for this year's awards. What was the business you did back in high school? <laughs> so I was, a, I was a boarder at Nelson College um, and one of the biggest problems that I faced um, was, you know, when you went to do your washing, you had a kind of a, combi- a shared drying room that you used to put all your clothes in and inevitably every time you put a load on it would you'd end up with socks and undies missing and things because they get chucked around and so you'd you're constantly running out of undies and socks so socks and jocks I should say so we actually came up with the idea of just um getting a um like a, 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 a like a wholesale account for jockey and going around the boarding houses and, and getting boarders to buy a whole bunch of socks and jocks on the appearance house account um, and we actually ended up making quite a few thousand dollars within the space of about a week once we got the um, the business set up <laughs> which is really interesting do you think entrepreneurs are born or bred oh, I don't know I mean I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur I think that's always been part of my um, my ambition um, but you know you can certainly learn learn the skills and the processes and I think you know from previous experience working in startups I learned a lot from from that and and I was able to kind of take that into my own business. Um, Kiwi entrepreneurs in particular are often criticized for not being ambitious enough uh, what's, what's your view on that? Yeah I think so I think we probably get so down in the detail of our products and, and innovations that maybe we lose sight of the fact that you know, we need to get out there and promote ourselves. Um, and it's certainly hard being in New Zealand um, and trying to make make noise around the world. So I think, I think we we probably are we probably undersell ourselves a bit. Um, and so I'm always sort of trying to challenge myself to step out of that comfort zone. Mm. What advice would you give a budding entrepreneur looking at starting out? Um, sort of around what I talked about in terms of, I'd, I'd say start with governance, you know, find people that um, can support your, your dreams and ambitions and, and support the business and provide complementary skill sets that, that challenge you. I mean, I'm outnumbered on our board of directors, so I have to really sell what I want to do to these guys to, to make it happen. Um, and I think that kind of check and balance is, is really healthy um, because you think you have all the, uh, the answers, but often you just need to sort of refine those a little bit. So governance, I would say, is important. Um, there's incredible services here in New Zealand like Callahan Innovation, um, NZTE, when you're ready to export. Those, they have relationship managers that can guide you through setting up a, um, a company overseas or getting, or grants. getting grant funding mm-hmm. while you're here. We've picked up students from um, internships that are now full-time developers with us. And, yeah, there's an incredible support network there. Thanks for your time, Scott Cardwell. Thank you, Fiona.